You would please note that you uh, should have received a bulletin or a program as you came into our worship center. And in that bulletin, it lists just a variety of experiences that we have coming up in the, in the weeks to follow. So I want you to take a look at that. I won't talk about all of the details of that, but I will highlight just a few, if you would, for the benefit of the body of Christ here. We have a few new courses that are getting launched. One just started today. It is not too late to jump on board, though. It's our new spiritual basics course for those who are on their way into our community of faith or just want to go over the fundamentals, the basics of the Christian faith. Again, you are welcome to be a part of that. Um, real good group has already begun. And then we have the book of John being studied in room four during Sunday school at 945, and you're welcome to be a part of that new experience. Um, after, uh, let's see, after this service, if you did not go through the retraining of our child protective policies, then please see uh, myself or Sharon England, and we will get you the paperwork that you need to get you back reviewed and ready to go for our Vacation Bible School, which is here just around the corner. If you're wanting to be a part of any of our children's ministries teams, then there is a more extensive than just the review that we're offering today, and that is going to be Monday night. I will be leading that at 7 o'clock. If you're interested in working with the children, you need to go through that experience with me, and I would be more than happy to get you on board. We're always looking for more team members. So be aware of those two experiences. Um, um, and then we have, let's see, oh, there's probably lots of other that you can look at it on your own in the bulletin, and we will go ahead and get started officially by inviting the Lord's presence to be among us. Let's do that now. Father God, thank you that you have invited us into relationship with your Son, Jesus Christ. And we give you honor and glory. We pray that we would make room for him here in our worship and in our hearts as we look to you um, to be the, the need meter of everything that we have. And we just pray and thank you for your presence here among us. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, God. 
service we're going to be um, commemorating that that sin that thing that action that Jesus did that washed our sins away by taking communion and as we take communion we are freed from all of the things that bind us just like this next song says I'm no longer a slave you Father God, you truly are above all things. We worship you. We give thanks for you. We lift our joys and concerns to you. And we know through faith that you will take care of us and you will provide. We return a portion of the blessing you have given each of us that your ministry may continue. Amen. You may be seated. How are you? William, you don't look thrilled to be here. Are you happy to be here today? <laughs> He's not even answering my question. That's a scary thought. Well, you know what? A long time ago, there was a song that came out. Who can read this? Who can read it? William, what does it say? The, this, that part. Love in, any Love in any language. That's right. And we're talking today about love. And how many of you know how to tell people that you love them? What do you say? I love you. That's right. How many people know what this means? I love you in American Sign Language. Can you do it? This is like Spider-Man. Spider-Man. His is like this, though, isn't it? All right. It comes out of his wrist. Well, there you go. Well, I have something else. If you lived in Mexico, how do you think you would say, I love you? Yeah, how, how would you say it in Spanish? Te amo. Can you say that? Te amo. Te amo. Easy enough. How about if you lived in Germany, how would you say it? 
in Germanish. Ich liebe dich. That's a little bit harder. Ich liebe dich. And you got to get that ch going in your throat. All right. How about if you lived in France? Je t'aime. Can you say je t'aime? That's right. So everybody all around the world knows you wish, well, you could tell people je t'aime. They might look at you like you look crazy. But you know, our scripture this morning is from the book of John. And it's a story about Peter and Jesus. And they were on the beach one morning eating breakfast and Jesus said, hey, Peter, do you love me? And Peter said, yes, I love you. And Jesus said, feed my, feed my lambs. Peter, do you love me? And Peter said, yes, Jesus. I already told you that once. You know I love you. And Jesus said, then feed my sheep. And darned if a third time Jesus didn't look at Peter and say, Peter, do you love me? Well, Peter had already answered Jesus twice. And by this time, he was a little irritated. And he said, yes, Jesus, you know I love you. Duh, I already told you that. And he was a little put out. And when we were in Israel, we were at a place called, well, it's right where, um, it's, well, it's where Jesus walked. And there's a place that has six big stone hearts, sort of like that one in the grass set. And five of them are all lined up. And one of them is bigger and a little crooked and a little set away. And that represents the conversation that Jesus had with Peter. Because Jesus said, Peter, do you love me? Peter said, yes, I do. Jesus said, Peter, do you love me? Peter said, yes, I do. Jesus said, Peter, do you love me? And a little bit louder and a little bit off to the side, Peter said, you know that I do. So that, those stones are there for a long, long time to remind people of that story. Now, why do you think that Jesus asked Peter three times, do you love me? Because he, he didn't answer. No, he did answer. I think it's because Jesus wanted Peter to make, yes, that he really did love him? What do you think, William? Yeah. To tell people about God. I think that Jesus was just making sure that, P hey, Jake, come on up, that Peter absolutely loved him and that Peter knew that there's more to just telling people, I love you. You have to show them, I love you. You can't just walk up to say somebody and say, I love you, and then punch them, right? Is that kind of weird? Yeah. You can't walk up to somebody and say, I love you. You have an unugly dress. Can't do that, can you? I don't think so either. You have to show people you love them. And you show them you love them by being kind to them, by doing this. Oh, thumb out. Thumb out. You show people you love them by being kind to them, by helping them if they need help, by um, giving them food if they're hungry, um, by, in, by telling them about Jesus, by inviting them to church, all kinds of ways. So this week, when you think about this story about Jesus asking Peter three times, do you love me? Make sure that Jesus knows that you love him too, because Jesus can also just as easily say, Jacob, do you love me? Jacob, do you love me? Jacob, do you love me? Yeah, right? So let's remember that this week, that, that we really do need to let Jesus know that we love him by the things that we do and the actions that we take, right? Let's pray. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray a little bit, and then I want you guys to pray right after me. Fold your hands. Dear Jesus, Jesus help, us to show our love help us to show our love for you, for you. by loving and caring for one another. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to be in the Lord's house today. And I want to thank uh, Robert for speaking last week. Everybody think he did a good job. Give him a hand, okay? <laughs> we always hear good things. Uh, thanks, Robert. And um, uh, so um, last week, uh, last service, we celebrated a, uh, an anniversary. Bruce and Carolyn Cyril was their 39th 
39th wedding anniversary, so that was great. So um, also we got to go see uh, Sandy Woods' hometown, Durango, Colorado. That was a long way, man. I'll tell you what. I should have a stiff neck from driving that far. And uh, my daughter, she's helping uh, doing her internship out there. So she's leading worship this mor- last night and three services this morning. So that's going to be a good experience for, for her. And uh, so uh, another way we were, we were um, coming back and we stopped in Junction City, Kansas for the night. That's a way out there in the sticks. And, uh, uh, and uh, that's not even sticks. There's nothing out there. So, uh, but there's a military base nearby. So on the way home, we thought, well, are we going to go to church today? Okay, so we found this church. And, and we chose it for a real spiritual reason. It was at 10 o'clock. <laughs> and it was closed. So, um, so we went there as this Episcopal church. And... Do you know they drink out of the same communion cup, everybody? And I said, I want to know the alcohol content of that because it better be a lot. But <laughs> kill the germs. So anyway, uh, uh, that was kind of interesting, not seeker friendly. And, uh, but anyway, um, uh, we were there and it was Memorial Day. And the guy was telling the story of who used to go to that church. And one of them was, have you ever heard of General Joseph Wainwright? You ever heard of him before? He was the, he was the general that was in charge of the Philippines when the Japanese started to attack and they got MacArthur, General MacArthur out of there and sent him to Australia so he could still lead the command. And I guess the, the Japanese were coming in like bees all over that, the, the Philippines and eventually uh, to save some of his men, uh, General uh, Joseph Wainwright had to negotiate terms of surrender with the Japanese to save some of his men. And so they went as prisoners. He was the highest ranking officer ever to be taken prisoner of war and uh, I guess MacArthur was pretty upset with him that he surrendered but MacArthur is in safe Australia and he's getting overwhelmed by uh, the Japanese so he negotiated terms of surrender but three years later when he came off the plane in New York MacArthur was there to meet him and to uh, give him a big hug when he came off the plane he was pretty emaciated after being in a Japanese uh, prisoner of war camp which was almost worse than death and then another guy who was on the administrative council of that church for a, a long time because back in the 30s they weren't promoting people uh, in the military they'd cut back so far you know and anybody know who that was it was George Patton he was on the administrative council of that church and it, it, he was kind of a leader in the church I hope he didn't learn his language there but um, uh, anyway he uh he, he, I guess he paid a lot of their bills, and his wife was independently wealthy, and so she took a lot of the bills home and paid them herself. And I just want to know if there's anybody here like that today. With, <laughs> but anyway, uh, they had they had a, one pew with Joseph Wainwright's name on it, another one with George Patton's name on it, and somebody else said his wife should have a pew to herself because she paid a bunch of bills, and this church wouldn't even be here without her today. So. Anyway, uh, uh, update on the settles. We did see them, and um, a little bit uh, update is that uh, Emily is sitting up and smiling. She has some of the tubes taken out. Uh, she does have a GI tube. She's being fed through a GI tube, uh, and their, her bone marrow biopsy will be next week. The chemo has brought her blood levels back to, to more normal. Um, and they hope to get her into intense physical therapy. So that's kind of the status right now. So anyway, so uh, let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come into your presence today and we give you thanks and praise for all of your, uh, your greatness and power, faithfulness and love. We thank you for the beauty of the creation that you've made, for the life that you've given us, and for... Uh, the, the fellowship of this body and of Christians around the world. Uh, we, we thank you for your love for us and, and especially your love in Jesus Christ. We thank you that you redeem sinners and uh, you came to redeem us. We thank you for the Holy Spirit and we just pray for the comfort of your spirit for the Settle family today and for your healing grace and Emily's life, and for your healing grace in all our lives. We pray this morning 
that you would be with us as we continue to worship you. Be with all those on our healing prayer list. And uh, we pray for um, our own conference this week as, we, as uh, our annual conference is this week for our church. So we pray for our bishop and our uh, district superintendents and the, and the leaders in our conference and denomination. Pray that you'd be with us. And we pray now, uh, we also, we pray for all the graduates. We give you thanks for all the graduates we have and, and uh, you bless them and be with them. And we pray now the prayer you taught your disciples to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture this morning comes from the last chapter of the Gospel of John. If you are able, please read, rise for the reading of the word. As Sandy alluded to during the children's sermon, uh, Jesus is talking with Simon Peter and asking him some rather pertinent questions. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. And again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. And the third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus had asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. I tell you the truth, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and take you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And then he said to him, follow me. Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Because of this, the rumor spread among the brothers that this disciple will, would not die. But Jesus did not say that he would not die. He only said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You may be seated. Well, have you ever uh, been kicked off a team or, or kicked out of school or kicked out of anything? Well, we were at a bunch of, uh, I think we went to three different high school graduation things yesterday, you know, and so uh, that was all nice. I'm glad you all graduated. That's fun. And, um, but uh, like when I was in high school, my senior year, it reminded me something happened to me. I, it was the fall of my senior year in high school, and I was part of this group called High Y, and they were a, a Christian organization supposed to be, but the big thing we did every year was we built a bonfire for the homecoming football game, which was usually like early October, you know. And so a bunch of us, a bunch of us guys are in this thing. We're, we're getting the bonfire ready, so we're going out in the woods behind some of these guys' houses, and we're cutting down these old trees, you know, and... Uh, and every year they try to build a bigger bonfire than the one they had last year. So we're out, you know, chopping down trees and everything. And they always have a big telephone pole put up so that we come and lay all these other big logs against it, you know. And, and we're doing that on a Saturday and we're putting it up. We say, this is going to be the best bonfire ever, you know. And uh, so our, our sponsor was the assistant football coach, Corky Axon. And uh, he was also the health teacher. 
And so there was about, I don't know, there was about 12 of us that day, and, and it was hot, late September, before the early October football game. So, um, which would be the next week. So uh, we're putting, we're, we put up the bonfire. He let us into school to get a drink of water. Well, somebody comes up afterward and they said, hey, Mark Swanner, who's our best football player, and he's ornery, he's going to hide in the women's bathroom. Why? Well, after Corky leaves, he's going to let us in. We're all going to go in and play basketball in the gym. Okay, I, that's, that's not really bad, is it? Uh, okay, all right. So, you know, so we're all, we're, we're all waiting behind the building. Corky leaves, and somebody knocks on the door, and Mark comes out and lets us in. So we go in. Now, I'm thinking we're going in, and we're going to go shoot around. But these guys, there's these candy machines. And it's the old candy machines that were hanging by a hook. So some of the guys start shaking the candy machine and some cookies fall down in the, in, you know, the compartment. The guy goes, cookies, let's kick the glass in. And, and me and uh, this guy, Chuck Stone, we go, let's, let's get out of here. So we, we walk out. Well, actually, before we walked out, they almost tipped one over and we had to push it back up so they didn't break it. And then we walked out. Well, we're out by our car, and all of a sudden, three guys hit the door. Bam, 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 three doors. Corky's in here. Get out of here. So we get in our cars and leave. But what happened was Corky realized none of the players came out from behind the building. So he thought something's up. So he drives up to the teacher's parking lot, walks down the stairs, and sees these guys, you know, shaking the candy machines. And he yelled some things I can't repeat right here. But he basically said, get out of here, you know. So Monday morning, we're at school. I'm in my second period class. <clears throat> Mr. Friedenberger, the assistant principal, comes and says something to the teacher. Then he goes, Ballinger and Shively, go down to the office. Sweat starts coming down, you know. So we get down there, and there's the, there's a, the assistant principal, the, the principal, the athletic director, and everybody else. And they take each of us in a room one by one. They start giving us the third degree. Basically, you know, we want to get to the bottom of the story. Who's the main instigator of this whole thing? It was Mark Swanner. <laughs> uh, um, who let you in? Why did you do it? How old are you anyway? I'm 17. I'm almost 18. Do you know you, that's breaking and entering. There, there was vandalism going on. But we didn't vandalize anything. Uh, uh, and, and um, you know, and so uh, they didn't know what to do with all of us. So what they did was, it's Monday. They, they suspended us all for three days. So that means we could be back by Thursday, and we all got to play in the game on Friday. But it, it was kind of scary, because if you get kicked out of school, it, at that time, it was three and a third off your grade each day. Three and a third off your grade. Well, I'm only taking so many classes as a senior, and if I get below like a D, you know, I could, or, or get an F because of that, I, 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 I might get kicked off the football and the basketball team. So, you know, I'm thinking, oh, my grades are in trouble. I might get kicked off the football team. I might... I get kicked off the basketball team. I have to go tell my mom. I have to go tell my mom I got kicked out of school. She's working at an elementary school. I have to go there. It's like 11 in the morning. What are you doing here? Guess what, mom? I got <laughs> kicked out of school. <laughs> and then she goes, well, you need to go tell your dad. Now, my dad works nights. He's sleeping. I have to go wake him up and tell him, hey, dad, what? I got kicked out of school. He starts laughing. But it wasn't a happy laugh. You know what I mean? It wasn't a happy laugh. I have to go down there. You know, it's like 2 in the afternoon. And, well, they, the boys did this, you know. And my dad goes, you know, well, I'm glad you caught him. I'm glad he needs to learn some lessons and all this stuff. And I'm going like, sue him, Dad. Come on. Let's, let's get the... Let's go sue. I'm kidding. Uh, and um, anyway, so... Uh, AD's upset, assistant principal, principal, coaches, they're all teachers, all like disappointed in us, you know. Fortunately, everyone was merciful, and we still got to stay on the team, and my, my grades did suffer, though. I would have had three A's and a B. I got two B's and two C's, so I was fortunate, you know. So that was my only experience of getting kicked off a team, or, or, or thinking I was going to. But I wonder if Peter thinks he's getting kicked off the team. You know, I wonder if he thinks he's flunked out of disciple school. Why would he think that? Well, 
Because he said in front of everyone, Lord, though everyone else deny you, I will never deny you. I'm willing to go to jail with you. I'm willing to die with you if need me. Do you remember what Jesus said? It was in Luke 22. He said, no, Peter, before the rooster crows, you'll deny three times that you even know me. Oh, no way. Well, Jesus is arrested, and the authorities are taking him away. Peter following behind, you know. He goes to warm himself by the fire. And a little girl said, you're one of Jesus' followers, aren't you? No, no, none. I mean, he's afraid of a little girl. Give me a break. Big, strong Peter. Somebody else comes up. You're, you were with Jesus, weren't you? No, I don't even know the man. He's still warming himself. Somebody else comes up and goes, you, you're, you have a Gal Galilean accent. You're one of Jesus' followers, aren't you? No, I don't even know the guy. And a rooster crows. And it says, Jesus turned and looked at Peter. And Peter was so convicted that he went out and wept bitterly. He was really sorry that he buckled under pressure. Have you ever done something wrong? Have you ever done something so bad you thought maybe God wouldn't even talk to you again? <laughs> well, Peter, you know, Jesus is crucified on Friday and he's buried. But three days later comes the resurrection. Jesus rises from the dead. He appears to Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene goes back and says, the Lord is risen. <coughs> now, Peter and John are going, well, you know, we can't trust them. You can't trust this lady. <laughs> so they run down to the tomb. They run down. Now, John outruns Peter because he works out more than Peter does. You know. And uh, goes the why. Everything. And he gets there and he and, and John just stops and looks in. Peter keeps on running. He runs all the way into the tomb. Now, what they find when he gets in the tomb is that the tomb isn't empty. There's something that's still there. It's the grave clothes. Now there's something about the grave clothes that a grave robber would have left everything a mess. But it almost looks like this is probably what happened. That it's they're not unwrapped. It's almost like, and probably what happened, Jesus passed through those grave clothes into a totally new existence. And the headpiece, the, the part that covered the head was folded and placed where the head was. Mary must have done a good job of raising her son to make his bed like that. You know what I mean? My mom did a bad job. But anyway, <laughs> don't tell my mom. I'm just kidding. But, uh, uh, but Peter's going, maybe? Maybe the Lord is risen. But I wonder what he thinks of, of, of me. Well, in John chapter 20, verses 19 to 23, um, if you remember this, it says, uh, on the first day of the week, Jesus, they're, they're behind locked doors in an upper room, and Jesus appears to them. How does he get in there? Well, we don't know. But Jesus is in there, and it says, he says, peace be with you. What a great thing to speak to a bunch of people. Wait a minute, you died, you were buried. And he says, see my hands. A, a ghost doesn't have flesh and bones as you see I have. Touch my hands. And then Jesus, uh, and they were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And then it says, uh, Jesus says, peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And he breathed on them and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. And Peter's going, the Lord is really alive. But I wonder what he thinks of me. Well, he's got about a week to think about it. And a week later, if you remember, somebody wasn't there when Jesus appeared to the disciples. His name was Thomas. And it says... Uh, the next week, on another Sunday, uh, Jesus appears to him again. What's he say to him? Uh, he says, peace be with you. Remember, the, Thomas wasn't there. He said, I'm not going to believe. I don't believe Jesus rose. I don't care all ten of you guys saw him. He goes, I didn't see him unless I put my finger in his hands and his hands in his side. I won't believe. Jesus shows up and he goes, peace be with you. Thomas. Come here. Put your hand here in my hand. Put your hand here in my side. Don't be unbelieving, but believing. 
And this is where people are today. All kinds of people saying, I'm not going to believe unless I can see it and feel it and touch it. And this, the Christian faith is the most physical of all the religions. It's not some spiritual weird thing out there. There was a time when you could see the Lord, touch the Lord. And we believe because of them. And, and so Thomas goes up there and he touches him. And he says, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Thomas, you believe because you've seen. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. We believe because what they saw. For, uh, 2 Peter 1, 16. 2 Peter 1, 16. I don't know if you want to follow along with me here. 2 Peter 1, 16. Is that up there? Okay, want to read it with me? We did not follow cleverly invented stories when we told you about the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of His majesty. We believe because of what they saw and heard and felt and touched. And then uh, John goes on to say, and, and Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of His disciples, which are not recorded in this book. John records about eight miracles and he said these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ the Son of God and that believing you might have life in his name that's why the book of John was written that you might not be unbelieving but believing you know, Peter's thinking there going wow this is really true the Lord is risen but I wonder what he thinks of a failure like me. Well, Jesus hadn't showed up for a while. He showed, he showed himself to him twice. He hadn't showed up in a while. And uh, Peter's probably thinking it over. You know, I'm a failure. I might as well go back to my old profession. You know, I was a good fisherman. I made a pretty good living as a fisherman. I was pretty good at it. I'm going fishing. Other disciples go, Wait up, we're going too. He's going back to his old profession. Peter is a natural leader. People just kind of follow him, you know. I'm going fishing. He goes fishing. Now, in, uh, they fished all night. They fished all night. Do anybody know how much they caught? They caught nothing. Well, in John 21, it says, Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore. Now, they're about 100 yards out in the boat. And they're fishing. They're about 100 yards out. And, and this guy goes, hey, have you caught anything? No, I haven't caught anything. He said, throw your net on the other side of the boat. You might catch something. They throw it on the other side of the boat. All of a sudden, the nets are just completely full. John recognizes who it is. He said, it's the Lord. Peter, he wraps his outer garment around. And he jumps in the water. Just like Peter, right? He jumps in the water, 100 yards out, starts wading in, you know. And uh, the other disciples are over there grumbling. Oh, Peter, he ain't helping us with the, yeah, with the net here. And uh, so then Peter goes back, helps them drag the net in. They drag the net in. Anybody know how many fish were in there? 153 large fish, and the net wasn't broken. And that, he records that because this is like a miraculous thing. The net, no, no place in the net's broken. 153 large fish. Now, you know, I think this is something like, as a, as a church, we're doing the fruitful congregation journey, and, and uh, maybe it's time for us to get a big catch, you know? Large fish represent people. <laughs> we had our, um, um, we kind of got a new pro a process for, you know, we use, we'll have a time of refreshments with the pastor, now we have a spiritual basics course. How many we have in there, like 12 or 13 or 14 people today in our spiritual basics course, you know that? That's good. A spiritual, it's just a time to come and investigate. Is that you're not making a commitment yet necessarily, but it's time, you, you, you can have already made a commitment or, or not, but it's like a, a time to, to, to learn and find out what it's about. But, but uh, anyway, 153 large fish. Now, what's Jesus doing? He's, he's got a fire going. He's got a fire going, and he's cooking some fish. Hey, bring some of the fish you've caught. Jesus is cooking for the disciples. Now, see, this reminded him of what happened early in Jesus' ministry in Luke chapter 5. 
uh, Jesus, there's so many people. He goes, I need a boat to teach from. These people are crowded. Hey, can I borrow your boat? Sure. And, he, and uh, Peter's out there, you know, fixing these nets. And, and, and Jesus taught the people. And then he said, okay, uh, come on in the boat here. Launch out into the deep and let out your nets for a catch. Now, Peter's the expert fisherman. Well, Lord, you know, I'm the expert fisherman here. And we fished all night and we didn't catch anything. Nevertheless, at your word, we'll do it. So they go out. And they go out fishing. They put the nets out. They catch so many fish in the nets that the boats are starting to sink. Now, Peter knows there's something supernatural about this. He goes, Lord, go away from me. I'm a sinful man. And Jesus said to him, from now on, you'll be catching men. Isn't it amazing? Here's Jesus, the Son of God, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, this is, a, uh, this is the kind, he takes a towel and wraps around his waist and washes the disciples' feet. And now here he is, he's bore the sins of the world, he's risen from the dead, and he's cooking breakfast for the disciples. Isn't that kind of amazing? Do you guys like fish for breakfast? <laughs> well, now comes the interview that Peter's probably been... Peter's probably been dreading, and, uh, and, and, and this is already, uh, it's John um, 21, 15 to 17. And so, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? And he answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You, you know that I love you. Now, in the, in the English, we only have one word for love. And love can mean anything. I love my mom. I love chocolate. You know, I love... Uh, the Colts, <laughs> you know, I love all kind of stuff. Um, but in the Greek, they have three words for, they have four words for love. Agape is the unconditional, I love you, period, love, no matter what. Now, storge is another word for love in the Greek, and it, it means family affection, you know. Uh, then there's another word for love. It's uh, called phileo, and it's... Uh, um, means like brotherly affection or brotherly love. And then there's uh, eros, which is the romantic type of love. What, what was the French word? Jetam. It sounds like shazam. <laughs> so anyway, uh, uh, so anyway um, uh, Jesus, you, here's, how the, here's how it would go um, in the Greek. Okay, Simon... Do you agape, have unconditional love for me more than these? And Peter doesn't use agape. He uses brotherly affection. He goes, Lord, you know that I have brotherly affection for you. I don't think Peter can bring himself to say I have unconditional, total commitment love to you because of his recent denial. I don't think he can bring himself to say it. You know I have brotherly affection for you. Simon, do you love me more than these? And he says again, he goes, Jesus used the word agape. Peter again says, Lord, you know I love you. I have brotherly affection for you. So the third time, Jesus comes down to his level. He says, Simon, do you, do you have brotherly affection for me? He meets him where he is. Peter said, you know all things, Lord. You know that I have brotherly affection for you. Maybe, maybe Peter's a tough guy. I, I consider myself a tough guy. <laughs> I have a hard time saying I love you to people. Love you, man. Yeah, me too. But, I mean, I, 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 maybe that's a guy thing, you know. But, but uh, Jesus accepts him where he is, and he says, feed my sheep, tend my sheep, feed my lambs. And so um, three times Jesus asked, do you love me? Now notice here, he didn't ask if you believe in me. Peter, do you believe in me? Well, Lord, you know, you've appeared. This is the third time you've appeared to us, and, and I have touched your hands, and, I've, uh, and, and I saw you eat fish, and is, I believe in you. I, I have faith. I mean, I believe that you're, you know, risen. But Jesus didn't ask that. He said, 
do you love me? Do you love me? Three times. And Peter was grieved as the memory of his recent denial rushed into his mind. But that's all part of the redemptive process. Peter had denied the Lord three times. Now Jesus asks him three times to affirm his love so that he can wipe out the memory of his past failure. And what a Savior. Jesus reinstates Peter as a disciple and as a leader among the disciples. And each time Peter affirmed his love, Jesus responded with the admonition, Feed my lambs, tend my sheep, feed my sheep. True love for Christ always involves responsibility, which in turn involves sacrifice. Love for God is not only an emotion to be enjoyed, it is a motivating force that leads to action. Feed my sheep. If Peter genuinely loved Jesus, he was to demonstrate it by caring for the Lord's people. And those who love Christ have a task to perform. What is, what is Christ calling you to do for him? as an act of loving service. Peter's ministry after Pentecost and final sacrifice and death, according to tradition, Peter um, asked to be crucified upside down. He's going to be crucified for his faith. He asked to be crucified upside down because he didn't feel he was worthy to die as his Lord had died. And this became the demonstration of his love for the risen Lord. And so today Christ asks us the same question. He asks us, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Well, Lord, I, I love my wife. I love my mom. I love my kids. I love the Colts. I love hot chocolate. I love Mexican food. <laughs> Anybody in here ever deny Christ before? Anybody in here ever backslide in their relationship with Christ? Anybody ever afraid to witness for Christ because you might be afraid what people think? Anybody ever just need to make their relationship with Christ current? He asked you and me the same question today. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? I know the first time I made a commitment to Christ in junior high, my mom would say, have you ever thought about being baptized? No, I don't want to be baptized. Not ready for that. Then I went away to basketball camp and they talked about God and everything and I was scared and it was my first time away from home and I came back and said, okay, I, th I think, I think I'm, I'm ready. So I went before the church and they asked me, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and do you accept Him as your personal Savior? Yes. The next week they baptized me. And I'll tell you what, that lasted about two weeks. And then a couple years later, uh, all the churches go together and they bring in some evangelist and he comes in and about the third or fourth night he's talking about the second coming of Jesus Christ and are you ready? No. I go down and pray with somebody and that lasted about two weeks. Go to college, quit going to church, you know, not sure I believe, not sure what I believe, but I know that I'm away from mom and dad and I'm going to do, have fun. But I found a lot of this stuff that I thought was fun wasn't so fun. And a lot of this stuff was actually kind of scary. And then uh, somebody invited me to hear about a guy speak about Christ. And what, what was a big turnaround point for me? Can you bring up 2 Peter 1.16 again? Um, 2 Peter 1.16, I uh, went through that uh, already. But, but it, was, it was that verse that we did not follow cleverly invented stories that we told you about the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of His majesty. This is real stuff. They saw the Lord. They touched Him. We were eyewitnesses. Do we believe the eyewitness testimony of the apostles? And then John in 1 John 1.1, 1, 1, if you could bring in 1 John 1.1. 1, 1. Here, John's in this story too, and this is what John says. You want to read it with me? 
that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. And so, this is really true. But I don't have the power to live, I don't have the power to live for you, God. So the evangelist said that we could pray and ask Christ to come into our hearts. So I did it again. This time it seemed to make a difference. I, I got more interested in the Bible. I started reading the Bible more. I start, started growing. But it doesn't mean that there weren't times of growth and times of sliding back. And times of growth and times of sliding back. And, uh, and, and there have been times that I have uh, wept over my own sin and failure. Thinking, God, God how could you even use a person like me. And he goes, well, you're about the only thing I got to work with. <laughs> I can only work with humans. So, anytime we fail and come back, here's the question Jesus asks us. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Can a backslider be restored? Peter was restored and given a task. And Jesus wants to restore you and he wants to give you a task. Because when we, when we commit to him, then he gives us a task to do to help build up his kingdom. Anyone ever feel like a failure? Anyone ever feel fallen and broken in need of forgiveness and restoration? As E. Stanley Jones said, when you stumble, stumble into the arms of God. And when you fall, fall on your knees and get back at once. Well, Jesus told Peter the kind of death that he would die eventually to glorify, to glorify him and... Uh, he looks over at John, and he's a little bit jealous and envious of John. And he goes, well, Jesus, what about him? What about John? And Jesus said, you know, it doesn't really matter about John. I got a different plan for John. You don't worry about John. You follow me. Well, what if my husband doesn't follow? He said, well... You know what? You follow me. What if my wife doesn't follow you? You know what? I'm working with them. You follow me. What if my kids don't follow? What if, my, what, what if nobody else follows you? Don't worry about it. You follow me. Maybe your life will have an influence on them. You're responsible for you. So, Peter, you follow me. Jesus asked you and me today as we come to the communion table. You know, this is real stuff. That's why the elements are real. You can feel them. You can taste them. You can smell them. You can touch them. The Christian faith is the most physical of all religions. Everything else said, woo! The, the, the Christian faith is, this is real. You know? And we believe because of the eyewitness testimony of the apostles. And so Jesus not only says, John wrote that you might believe and have eternal life, but Jesus asked you and me the question today. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Let's pray together. Lord, as we look at the, look at the apostles, you know, we know Judas betrayed you. Peter denied you, and the others forsook you. But you loved them all, and you went to the cross as our sin bearer. And you bore our sins upon the cross. Maybe we've failed because of social pressure, or maybe we haven't loved you as we should, but we thank you that you loved us enough to bear our sins upon the cross and to be buried and to rise again the third day for our justification. 
So Lord, help us to affirm our faith in you today and our love for you today and our gratefulness for what you've done for us. And then fill us with your spirit and show us the task in this church or in our home or community of how we might demonstrate our love for you by carrying out the tasks that you have for us and help us to follow you. Through Christ we pray. Amen. the sacrificial death and resurrection of the Son, and the cleansing and empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Amen.